thesis. And his quotation is saying that in my practical experience, the investigation of miscarriages of justice, the, the answers only rarely lie within the bundle. If you don't get out of the commission and go and investigate cases, then you're not going to find the real truth. You're not going to find out what's happening. It's interesting that that commissioner was not actually a lawyer. He was formerly a journalist, an investigative journalist. And you see that coming through, I think, in that quotation. So again, criticisms from outside, but also criticisms and concerns from within the commission as to really whether it's fulfilling its remit. Now, we did some research into investigations. Not only are we doing a large study in how the CCRC makes its decisions, not only do we care about decision-making to screen out cases initially, decision-making to investigate and subject cases to a thorough review, decision-making about whether to refer a court to the court, uh, a case to the Court of Appeal. But within that, we're particularly interested in this question of what kind of investigation does it actually do? Does it fulfill its remit in this sense? Now, in this case, I'm defining investigation in terms of going out and meeting with jurors or meeting with witnesses, meeting with the applicant, the person who thinks they have been wrongfully convicted, meeting with the original police officers who investigated the case, going to the scene of the crime, um, etc., etc., seeking expert evidence, seeking forensic evidence, for example. I am not referring to the review of the documentation. Now, that's not to say that is not thorough and important, and I think they do that awfully well. They go through piles and piles and piles of paper, they see new legal arguments in those, they see missing evidence in those. So I'm not saying that's not thorough investigation, but what I'm interested in here is going beyond that. Um, the, the Section 17 and Section 19 powers I can come back to, but that basically refers to their rights to insist that public bodies provide them with whatever data and information they have, and they have a legal statutory right to do that. The Section 19 power refers to their ability to be able to ask another police force, i.e. not the one involved in the original investigation, to investigate the police force that did the investigation. So they have those powers too, but I'm looking at how often do they get off their desks, get off their chairs, and go out and investigate. Now, the data sources that I draw on for this brief presentation are analysis of their formal memoranda and their casework guidance notes. Their formal memoranda are, are things that can be found on the internet, on their website, and they basically refer to um, their publicly stated aims in each particular case, their publicly stated process of investigation. The casework guidance notes are not available to the public and they are really in-house documents to tell them how to investigate specific types of cases. I'm also going to refer to analysis of case files. So I have access within the commission to all of their databases, which are all hold on, on computers, and show everything they do in every single case. So the case workers will document every bit of the investigation, and some will document every thought they have, every consideration, every conversation they have. So these are very thorough, enormous uh, resources of information on how they process cases. But we also did a survey of the case workers and we asked them questions about when they did investigations, when they chose to do it, when they chose not to do it. And we have many interviews with both the case workers and the commissioners. To just say briefly, the commissioners form the structure at the top, the managers, if you like, of the process. There are 11 of them at the moment. And the case workers, there are about 50 of them in the commission, the whole of England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. They do the bulk of the, the, the research and investigation. They make the decisions together. If we were looked at the formal memoranda, these public documents, there are various memoranda that speak to these issues. The one that's most interesting is the one that's specifically on interviewing jurors, because that brings in their, um, their intentions, if you like, on, on what sort of investigation they should be doing. But they also have casebook guidance notes on interviewing, on what kind of inquiries they should be making, and on gut instinct, which I think is a lovely expression. Now, the formal memoranda on interviewing takes an extremely cautious approach. So the first thing to think, if you're looking at an organization, you think, why doesn't it get out more and investigate in the way that a journalist might, for example, or a police officer might, if you look at the guidance that's given to them. And it definitely discourages exploratory investigation. 
So, for example, in all cases, there must be a belief that the interviewee is able to provide information or evidence that is material to the case review. Which is very interesting if you think about how would they really know that based on the evidence that comes in. And that just because the applicant says we should interview a witness, that does not necessarily mean we should. So sometimes applications come in along with uh, legal representation, uh, a lawyer they've employed who's, who's helped them build up the case, pointing them in the right direction. So some applications are very thorough, there's been some preparatory work done already, and they come in and say, hey, you should interview this person. We think we have reason to believe their story doesn't hold up. Or you should take forensics in this case. You should look at the firearms discharge residue, or you should look at the DNA samples, and you should retest them. We have reason to believe that you will find some evidence that's exculpatory in those um, in those tests. Others don't. Others come in direct from the prisoner. Usually, most applicants are in prison, still serving time, and they have very little information. Some of these applications, which are very poorly written, come in just in saying, I didn't do it, I'm innocent, please help. It's very difficult in those cases for somebody looking at the case files to know whether there's anything going to be there, to know which direction to look in. So you see there's this cautious approach from the beginning, and it's a cautious approach which is tricky in those cases that come in really quite bare of information. And then right in the middle, we found this piece of uh, information on the casework guidance note on interviewing. You remember, this is the, the document that is not for public viewing. It almost um, seems to suggest what I would say is a contradictory message. So take the opportunity to interview, it says, having been very cautious in other documents. It's rewarding, sometimes difficult, sometimes hilarious. I find that slightly disturbing, but we'll move on from that. But ultimately, it can give satisfaction. This seems to be more about the commission than, than the applicant would think. But then it says, right at the bottom, it can give you the evidence you need to refer it. So it's an organization just on its own paperwork, which is not quite sure what it should be doing and why it should be doing it as far as investigation is concerned. And it's this analysis of the legal documentation within the organization which persuaded us we should look a little bit more deeply into this. And you remember I mentioned a, a casework guidance note on gut instinct. And again, gut instinct is about when somebody will look through an application and it just doesn't quite add up. Maybe there's something about the profile of the applicant that doesn't fit with the actual crime committed. Maybe it's somebody who's never committed a crime, he's in his 50s. Maybe it's something about the witness. So whatever it is, sometimes commissioners and caseworkers have a gut instinct. Something just doesn't smell right about this case. And the case of the note talks about that. It talks about the tension between gut instinct and effective review. And again, that tension is there in all of the interviews that we did, a sense in which they think, I don't feel there's something quite right, but there's nothing in the bundles to suggest it's not right. How do I go about this? So it's an organization which has got some internal <coughs> contradictions. So we did this small survey. It's an online survey that we had the case workers do. And the, the questions guiding the survey were around how much and what types of investigation are you doing? Why are you doing them? What are the reasons? And why are you not doing them, more to the point? Are they mostly initiated by the caseworkers who tend to be uh, reasonably young from the age of probably about 25 on, but, but a lot of them in that younger age group? Some experience of uh, being a lawyer in the outside, some experience in some cases of, of doing some other kind of job, but tend to be relatively junior members of the team? Or is it indeed the commissioners who are in later life, have, have had established careers in the, in the law typically or other areas? Is it them that's guiding this? And how is this, what we saw as reasonably contradictory guidance from the, the formal memoranda and the case of guidance notes, how is that informing, if at all, those decisions? Now, we use this web-based survey. We had sent it out to 45 people. We only used the responses of 22 of those because some of the other responses were spoiled in some way. So we tried to keep it as methodologically pure as possible. I, I think I probably erred on the side of caution there, and I think Dr. Bradford has, has rightly criticized me and said I could use some, <laughs> some of the others, but we'll get on to that. So in just bold terms, <laughs> Full terms about this is the danger of using PowerPoint. It's a great aid for me, but not very good for you if you can't see what I'm looking at. In terms of how much investigation, so again, the investigation you remember are 
uh, arranging and collecting expert evidence, giving forensic tests, for example, visiting the scene, meeting with the clients, meeting with the applicants, sorry, meeting with the lawyers, uh, meeting with, with police officers and other witnesses, etc. And it turns out that in just over a third of cases of these, um, of these caseworkers that we interviewed, in just over a third of the cases, um, they had done this kind of investigation. So in over two, oh, sorry, just under two thirds of the cases, they weren't doing any of this type of investigation. It was all about the bundle. Now, of course, some of those cases, you won't need to do it. The evidence and the information will be in the bundle. It will be a finer point of the law. But beyond the finer points of the law, they're not going out very often, or not as often as you might have expected. So we then ask what types of investigation. And what you see from this table is that they're most likely, if they leave the commission and go out there, they're most likely to meet with the applicant and or with the uh, lay representative of the applicant. A lay representative, as distinct from a legal representative, would be um, a parent, a, a spouse, uh, a relative, a friend, somebody who knows something about the law but isn't actually representing them as a, as a lawyer. So that, that's the difference there. And then the other things, meeting with police officers, they do that quite frequently, seeking expert evidence quite frequently. They almost never, almost never visit the scene of the crime. Um, and they don't often actually meet with the legal representative. And by the way, the meeting with the legal representative also means having interviews on the telephone. So that's quite a low proportion of those cases. So we ask them, why do you investigate? You know, what, what is it that, that, that persuades you to go out there and talk to people? And it was quite interesting the way the data came in because you would expect the answers in the right column. You would expect that they would seek fresh evidence because, as you recall, the real possibility test directs them in that direction. It says seek and find fresh evidence else the court won't listen to you. So it's not surprising that when they meet with jurors or they visit the scene of the crime or they collate and collect forensic evidence, that they have that in mind. But what was more interesting for us was the procedural necessity, that what was happening with a lot of the interviews in particular, almost all of the interviews with, with the applicants, were initiated in an attempt to try to work out if the documents they had were accurate, if the information that they had was accurate. And um, same with the legal representatives. They're about procedural justice, if you like. They're about have, have the processes been done in the way they should have been done so far. And then there's some overlap, you see, when they meet with police officers or, or the trial or appeal lawyers, when they're doing a bit of both. They're both checking the, the information they have, especially if one of the witnesses was vulnerable, for example, and they're also trying to seek further information. So there's a, there's a combination of those things. As far as who initiates, uh, investigations. We were concerned that the caseworkers were not feeling confident enough to go out there and do their own thing, and that they were too much under the supervision of their commissioners. And you see there's a difference here. The, um, the blue line refers to the caseworker, so CRIM is an acronym for the caseworkers, but um, you don't have to worry about that. So, so the caseworkers primarily were making these decisions with, with, in a few cases, the commissioners making them for them. But on, on meeting with the applicant, again, it was largely the caseworker, uh, sorry, it was largely the commissioner who was driving that. So that seemed to be something that was coming out in the data that the commissioners felt this was an important part of the job. So we talked to caseworkers. Having had this, this sort of brief survey about the kind of things they did, we also interviewed them about why they did what they did. And what was interesting is that a lot of the caseworkers' views on the current practice were suggesting that it was very clear that everyone would, it would be obvious to everyone when casework was needed. So they say things like the commission is supportive of the investigative work that we do, providing it's justifiable in the context of the case. Again, this idea that somehow it's clear to them when they should and shouldn't be doing it. And indeed, that particular interview we went on to say, because we all know when investigative work is appropriate. Enormous confidence that they have the ability to be able to judge that. Um, and also the sense in which the case tells them how to do this. The case tells them, and each case has its own unique aspects, and they will direct them in one direction or the other, and they just have to use their common sense. So 
almost across the, the, the broad range of interviews that we did, they were saying very similar things, that they just knew it was common sense, you know, the guidance was there, but actually it's pretty obvious when you do and do, do it. And yet, apparently it's not. So here we have enormous, this is just our 22 cases that we kept in the sample, enormous variation in the investigation. So you have a case, a case number 18 has done in the last year, sorry, I should have said this data refers to just the last year. The other data on, on uh, the investigative work they did and why they did it was their whole career as a case worker. But we asked them just in the last 12 months, we gave them specific dates, so it's very clear, how many cases have you gone up there and done investigation with? And between them, they had investigated 341 cases. And in 341 cases, caseworker re uh, reference 18 had gone out and done 14 cases where she'd done or he'd done thorough investigative work. Whereas caseworker 16 had done one, and the caseworkers from two across the bottom of the, of the axis there had, um, had done only two. So enormous variability. Now, one thing to make clear at this stage is that these cases are given to caseworkers as they come in and as the queue gets longer and longer, they then appoint them to whoever's got the, apparently has, has the, the least caseload. So they're not chosen. There are very few occasions when a particular caseworker is chosen for a particular investigation because they have certain skills. And recently, immigration cases have been one of those examples. But by and large, files go out on a random <coughs> basis to whoever has space. So there should be no reason why certain cases, if they're randomly allocated, would be much more likely, certain caseworkers would be much more likely to do investigations than others. So having told us that it's obvious that it's in the case, that everyone knows when you do and don't do it, it apparently isn't obvious. Now, what we wanted to do is see if there was something about confidence, because caseworkers and commissioners kept telling us, oh, the more confident a caseworker is, the more likely they're to go out and do this kind of investigation. So we can't very well measure confidence or at least I don't feel qualified to do so. So we took experience, length of time working at the Commission as a proxy for confidence. It's a very rough estimate, and it's, it's, it, I'm sure you'd all want to criticise me for doing that, but it was the only way we could kind of work out what that might look like. And what we found is, not surprisingly, caseworker reference 16 had done no investigation. She'd been working there for less than a year. Now that doesn't surprise me, because it just might be that in that year those cases actually didn't need an investigation. But you see the first column, caseworker 18, she's been there between one and three years. And yet, she's done the most. And if you take um, caseworker 19, where the arrow points, and caseworker 3, where the other arrow points, they have both been there for more than 11 years. That's a very long experience in the, com in the, in the commission. And yet, one has done just two, and one has done 12. So it just didn't fit with us. We just didn't buy it that actually the case spoke to them and somehow they knew when to do it. This sort of inconsistency just wasn't plausible. Now, we also asked them about the efficacy of investigations. Um, and what you then get is some interesting data. So, so they say most of the applicants I've dealt with where you actually know fairly conclusively that there's compelling evidence against them actually come across all right. You know, this idea that you, know, you can tell a murdering psychopath by sit sitting off of them, or you can look in someone's eyes and they look completely innocent, it's nonsense. Now, we found that very refreshing, because what happens at the moment in the UK is some people who work for innocence projects, and there's a real controversy around that, which I'm happy to talk about in questions, they sometimes take up a cause because they firmly believe that this person must be innocent. And they even say things like, you just have to talk to them, you just have to look at them, and they're innocent. Now, thankfully, the people in the commission don't buy that. They meet people, and they have no idea whether they're innocent or guilty by talking to them. So it's interesting in b 2 then going out and, and interviewing applicants more often than doing the other investigative work. It's clearly not in order to look in their eyes. Now, what happens, though, sometimes when they do those investigations is that they do actually discover things. So there was an interesting case recently, the case of Sam Hallam, whose case was overturned by the Court of Appeal about a year ago, about 18 months ago. Um, a youngish man who was uh, sentenced to prison for murder, 
And they went out and they interviewed him, the caseworker interviewed him, because he had made two alibis. He provided to the police two alibis. And that automatically makes him look suspicious. Couldn't keep his story right. And what happened when they interviewed him, they not only found out that the second alibi had been provided because the police refused to believe the first alibi, but that despite a huge investigation by the Metropolitan Police Force, no one had thought to interrogate his mobile phone. And there, on his mobile phone, was the evidence that his first alibi was truth, truthful. The mobile phone showed a photograph of him, of his father, that he'd taken in the pub on the night that he was meant to be on the other side of London killing somebody. And as with mobile phones, this one had a, a date on the bottom, so it was, sorry, a date and a time. So it was clear, or at least fairly strong, exculpatory evidence. The police had never found that. The uh, commissioner and the, the case, case worker that went to interview in prison found that just in conversation. The other way in which investigations can be helpful, uh, a case of Andrew Adams. Um, what we had in that case is a very, very complicated robbery, murder, and then a gangland execution. It was a pretty awful case, so I won't go into the details, but suffice to say, in the bundle, there were lots of photographs of the scene where the car was meant to have made a getaway, and yet the CCTV camera had not, on the exit of the car park, picked up the main alternative suspect. So not the African, the alternative suspect. And they looked through this, they tried to find evidence. You know, he can't have done it because he wasn't leaving the car when the car was caught on CCTV the camera, he wasn't in it. And it wasn't until the caseworker visited the scene and went there that he found at the back of the car park this tiny little alley. No one had ever noticed it. No one had written about it. The investigation had not picked it up. It was the, 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 the sort of clue in the story that this person had run down the alley instead of leaving the car park. So again, sometimes they investigate the scene and they see things they could never have found in the bundle. The case of Warren Blackwell, again, I can talk about this later, but this was a case where a woman had not only alleged that she was raped by a man in the street, but that during the rape, he had, with a knife, written the word bitch across her chest. And she certainly had that injury. Now, when the caseworkers went to the scene of the crime, which no one else seemed to have picked up, it was quite clear that it could not possibly have happened where she said it would. It was a very busy street, street lights, CCTV camera, nothing picked it up. So it was highly unlikely this happened. What the investigation, by the way, had never noticed is that the word bitch was written in mirror writing. This was never in the case. They found this out later through looking at her scars. It's very hard to write in mirror writing unless you're doing it on yourself. She had actually done it on herself. So in going to the scene of the crime, it started people thinking about this case and digging deeper. And in digging deeper, they found that this man was innocent. And the woman had other um, cases in the past where she claimed to have been sexually assaulted and hadn't, and the police should have known that, and indeed did know that, but didn't tell anything. Um, am I going over time? <laughs> I've slightly forgotten. I will try to be quick. Um, they have in the Commission Investigations Advisors, they have people who are trained to give advice to the caseworkers and the commissioners on how to do investigations and when to do investigations. And again, I will slip, slip over this quite quickly, but they do a lot of very important investigative work, but there's a huge difference across the caseworkers in how often people use those resources, despite the fact that they're there on hand. So this commissioner, uh, sorry, this caseworker said, it's not uncommon for me to seek advice from the investigations advisors. But I think people differ. I don't necessarily go to see an advisor with a specific query. I go and sort of talk to them and bounce ideas off and, and, and advance this investigation that way. Other people never spoke to the investigations advisor. So enormous variability in the use of that kind of investigation resource in the commission. Now, the reluctance to investigate seems to, according to the, uh, the survey, come down to points such as the applicant didn't raise those issues. Uh, but I thought it wasn't going to be inculpatory or exculpatory. I mean, certainly if you have a rape case and the issue is around consent, then to do forensics on the semen is not going to help you at all because no one's saying that intercourse did not take place. It's about consent. So there's, there's some truth in that, of course. Some say the casework guidance notes didn't require it, but as you've seen, they don't really say what it should be required and the one it shouldn't be. So that seems like a strange response. 
No one said that they didn't enjoy it, and no one referred to resource pressures. And yet everybody we interviewed did, in fact, talk about resource pressures. Resource pressures are not just about how much money it costs to do an investigation, although that can run into the many tens of thousands with some of these forensic tests. But it also talks to the issue of how much time it takes to do this kind of investigation and the knock-on effect for the queue so you can wait years before having your case allocated to a caseworker. So that's what that refers to. And the commissioners, when we interviewed those, also had very different ideas. One of them just said, well, you know, most of the time they're not exculpatory or inculpatory. They don't give us anything, so what's the point? Another one, there's only 11 of them, by the way, there's huge variability amongst just 11 people. The other one says, we should first and foremost not be a legal organization, but an investigative one. We should do more than legal scrutiny. And he wants to see a shift to much more proactive work. So across the commission, and there's another one who's worrying, well, I'm not sure we've got the balance right. So, you know, people in the middle, people on either side. Huge variation. What it is, though, from our interviews, is a very worried organization. Despite its guidance and despite being structured by the real possibility test of the Criminal Appeal Act, it is worried it's not getting the balance right. Everyone we spoke to used the word worry or concern or uh, you know, unsure. When, it, when we probe them on interviews, they're just worried that they are letting cases slip through that are actually innocent. And they're also worried they're referring cases that actually the person might well be guilty and therefore they're going to make the Court of Appeal cross with them. They worry about that too. So getting the balance right is a great concern. So I'm going to leave you uh, with these couple of points here. This just summarizes the data. Investigations are just over a third of the cases. The sum of the case workers are proactive. Investigation is not only about fresh evidence, it's also about procedural uh, points. And what I didn't get a chance to mention is that one of those issues is that when they go and see applicants, they often do it because they're worried about the vulnerability of the applicants. They're worried that they won't understand letters written by them in legalese. They're worried that they won't uh, appreciate that this investigation has been done. So it's almost like a PR exercise. They're going to show them that they are working hard on this, they're taking their concerns seriously, even if they think it won't go anywhere. But they, we have found these enormous inconsistencies and variations in practice. But where does it leave us? Where does it leave us when we do this sort of empirical investigation? But well, leaves us with a lot of knowledge, but what it doesn't leave us necessarily is with some advice to give to the Commission. Because ultimately the Commission is trying to balance thorough, rigorous investigations to try to find out if people are actually innocent of these crimes with constrained resources. The government gives it only so much money to do this work. They have 1,500 cases a year, 1,500 applications a year that they have to process, long queues which are not good for justice. So really, how much is enough? It's not really an empirical question. We can provide the data, it's a normative question, it's a principal question. How they use those finite resources in each of these cases in order to find the ones that should be referred to the Court of Appeal is also a principal question, how to balance those resources. And just finally, that one of the commissioners said to me, it's all very well saying we need more investigations, but we can't afford more in all cases. So what we need is smarter investigations. And this is where, from normative, uh, sorry, from empirical to normative, we go back to empirical. We go take the circle round again, because I think currently we don't know what a smart investigation looks like. And it seems to me the Commission needs to engage much more with not just academics like us, socio-legal experts, but with forensics experts with evidence experts, criminal law evidence experts, to go outside of its uh, community, not just to do, interview these people involved in cases, but to interview the people who know about the criminal process and who know about scientific evidence. And as you will know here, scientific evidence has evolved enormously just in the last decade or two. And so to draw on those resources so that when it uses its finite resources to do investigations, it uses them in a clever way. It uses them to get maximum, what's that expression? For its, for its whatever that is, it's a silly expression, but maximum impact for its money. And so that's where I'm going to leave you. And I have now the job of introducing my colleagues. Thank you.
Dr. Alka Palmer. Um, I won't give her a long preamble because she doesn't have much time either, but just to say that she is, in the UK, the leading expert on Asian criminality and on policing. Uh, she does, her work is informed by theoretical notions of the implications of security practice upon notions of, of belonging, on ethnic identity, and really how criminal justice plays out in a multicultural society, which is what we have in the UK. She's got a new Oxford University book coming out, in the, in the not too distant future on her research on stop and search in London. Again, policing a stop and search is another arrow in her bow.